Well, did you know that this particular pencil has a material which has revolutionized our technology since last 14 years? You know, pencils have graphite, and graphite is essentially a large number of carbon lattices, the planar lattices, which uh, are billions of them are stacked on top of each other. Now, what happened about 14 years ago is that this particular one layer of, I'm sorry, uh, one layer of carbon atom was isolated, and then we started understanding its fundamental science and, and uh, its technological applications. This is called graphene, and after its discovery, 2010 Nobel Prize was given to two gentlemen from Manchester University for discovering it, and then it came into a social life in a massive, massive way. It's now there in various kinds of composites, it's there in 3D printing, it's there in building materials, and what not. But today I'm not here to talk about uh, graphene, uh, but I'm going to talk about an emerging concept of technology, uh, which is called quantum technology. And uh, graphene and similar materials after that became an integral part of the technology, a technology which probably holds our economic, strategic, financial, and many other uh, you know, future in its, uh, you know, in its category. Okay, so what happens is this particular technology depends on a certain type of platform, a device platform, a material platform. And this platform is called quantum matter. And quantum matter, as you can understand, essentially depends on quantum physics. And let me tell you what quantum physics is before we get in deeper into this particular subject. You see, classically, you can see me standing here, right? You can see me staying put, you can't see me moving. Problem is, this is not true for quantum particles, like electrons, like atoms, we are very, very small, and they obey the laws of quantum mechanics, in which, if you see me standing, then you do not know how fast I'm moving. I might be moving really fast. And if you see me moving really fast, then you know where I'm standing. It's very, very strange and very weird, actually. So it happens that most of the particles at the nanoscale, at the atomic scale, obey quantum mechanics or quantum physics, or laws of quantum physics, rather than classical physics. Quantum technology builds on these particular type of particles. Quantum matter gives the platform to build quantum technology on top of that. Okay. Now, what happened over many years, we learned quantum mechanics, and then it sort of didn't come out. We created technology for it. But over the last few years, we have been able to get a new hidden properties of quantum mechanics, not just the one which I just told you about, but certain other spooky properties. It's called spooky, and the reason I'll tell you later that we're able to extract from the materials, and that's the kind of material uh, forms quantum matter. Okay, quantum physics hasn't changed. Quantum physics as a subject, uh, the laws of quantum physics hasn't changed since its inception in early 20th century, and uh, there are extraordinary physicists, like physicists like you know, Max Planck, like Ernst Schrodinger, there are people like Warner Heisenberg and Niels Bohr, they laid the foundation of quantum physics. By the way, if you see this particular picture, it's a picture of Solvay Conference in 1927. 17 out of 29 attendees of this particular conference were Nobel laureates. So it's actually said that um, it's probably the most intelligent pictures ever taken. Okay, so that's not really the problem. The problem is the person at the center, who's sitting over there, he actually didn't believe in quantum theory. He actually went on telling that if quantum physics is right, then that's the end of physics as a science. That's because he thought that part of quantum matter, or quantum uh, theory, actually contradicted his theory of relativity. And the property that he thought contradicted is the cornerstone of quantum technology today. And that particular property is called quantum entanglement. I'm going to explain to you what quantum entanglement is because that is the spookiness 
about this new era of quantum technology. Suppose you have a friend, uh, two friends actually, uh, one, they are very far away, okay? They are, let me say, one in Mars, one in Jupiter, and you want to give them a couple of marbles. Now, you have these marbles which are really weird, they can be either red or blue, and you do not really know what they are, but then you want to send it to them. Fine, you got them here, and then before you pack them, there is an evil magician on Earth named quantum physicist. This person does his voodoo, and then quantum mechanically entangles these two uh, particles. What I mean by that is they're now entangled in that weird property of quantum mechanics. Fine, you don't know this, and you then pack them, and you send them to one to Mars and one to Jupiter, to your friends. And then what happens is the person who is in Jupiter opens it and finds the ball to be blue. Now it turns out, because of the property of quantum entanglement, the other person who is in Mars will be destined, will certainly find the other ball to be red in color. Even though you didn't know when you sent the balls what their colors were, okay? and vice versa. That means if the person in Mars found it blue, the person in Jupiter would certainly find it red. Now, this is something which Einstein didn't like, because he thought, wow, this is so far away. How can they exchange information? Because nothing can travel faster than light. But you know, we now know that he was at least not correct in this particular subject. 85 years of experiment has not shown any contradiction to this weird property of quantum entanglement. So you can say, fine, it's great, Einstein may be wrong, you might be right, so what's, what's for us? But it turns out that today we have certain technologies which are building on this weird property called quantum entanglement. And that's one weird uh, technology is called quantum communications. Super secure quantum communication. Something that cannot be hacked. Let me tell you how it works. So instead of, instead of you know, marbles, red and blue, now you use photons, which is quantum of light. And then this is a mobile phone call. Maybe that's going to be happening in next, I don't know, 10 years maybe. We will have photons which are entangled. That means we use a pair to convert, you know, convert our conversation into a photon. And that will go to the satellite, for example, and then get transmitted to the person who is on the other side. All right, so you start with uh, entangled photons. One is up, other is down. This is like a red color of a marble and a blue color of a marble. And then you keep one for your own record and send the other to the person. Now, because they are entangled, they are perfectly correlated all the time. Every pair is correlated. If someone tries to hack the mobile phone, then you are in trouble because the person who tries to hack it will have to check what is the color of the ball, or the arrow size, or arrow direction, and that essentially changes the state of the photon, destroying all the correlation that you have had. And this kind of complete destruction of correlation can be immediately de detected, and hence you know that someone is hacking. Now, this is fundamentally non-hackable you know, system. So this has made many of the countries invest massively into these super secure quantum protocols because uh, there is a lot of secret uh, conversations and, and meetings, etc. require complete uh, security. And now uh, China has already built a uh, 1,200 kilometers of uh, quantum communication line between Beijing and Shanghai, which uh, has millions of single photons essentially going every second from, you know, from one city to the other. But now what happens is, there is another application of quantum entanglement that we are really excited by, but marginally scared of, and that's the possibility of creating a quantum computer someday. Okay? A quantum computer is essentially like a classical computer, but since classical computer has got two bits, it's called a bit, in a zero state and one state, a quantum computer has, again, what you call a qubit, but it can only go an infinite number of states between zero and one. Okay, don't ask me how, that will take a long time. But 
because it can stay in a large number of states, it can do certain tasks much, much faster than a classical computer. And one of those tasks is search or factorization. And that has made ourselves, some of the banks and security, the governments, slightly edgy, simply because they're feeling insecure. But many of our passwords in the banks, which uses protocols of encryption, and one of them is called RSA uh, encryption, it essentially uses a product of two prime numbers. Now, what normally happens is that these pro numbers are so large that if you want to detect it by a standard classical computer lying on your desk, it takes longer than the age of the universe. Very difficult, very long numbers. But because quantum computers can actually decode these large numbers exponentially faster in principle, it can be done very quickly. And that has made things a little bit more concerned. And that's one of the reasons many of the countries are investing in a massive way to build something of this set up. But you know, I mean, when we discovered when we discovered this, this is the first transistor discovered in 1947, which, for which you know, Shockley got a Nobel Prize in 1956. We didn't know that this is going to be used in our laptops downloading movies from, you know, from satellites, right? Because how we use our technology is really depending on us rather than anybody else. So we don't know what you know, it's not just about what the computer, quantum computer can do, but the question is, what we do not know that his, its capabilities are, it can probably do much more things than what we envisage today. And that's why we need to build it. And quantum matter comes there, okay? For example, uh, if you need a quantum computation protocol, a uh, quantum communication, you need single photons. And, 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 and graphene-like system gives you defects that emit single photons. We have understood that. That's our investment in quantum matter. If you want qubits, which need to be entangled, and one of the best qubit is now single photon, uh, single atom qubits, which are made on silicon. Our capabilities today as scientists and engineers have gone down to one atom as a, a, as a transistor. And they are perfect. They're excellent for making qubits for the future. Okay. Actually, if you wish to, you can even play around with the superconducting qubits. The IBM Q experience already has a five qubit quantum computer essentially for everybody's use. For those who want to play around with certain quantum algorithms, you can have that. It's very interesting and very nice. But quantum computer, this, this quantum matter is not just about quantum computation. It's about uh, quantum sensing, for example, and it's about uh, you know, other kind of technologies. Any technology that new comes, it changes our understanding of fundamental science, and then it promotes another area, which probably completely unexpectedly comes out, and we say, wow, we should do this. And one such effect of quantum mechanics, or quantum technologies, quantum matter, is, uh, you know, this particular aspect called topological quantum matter. Uh, this particular heading hasn't come here. So it turns out, this is something very interesting. It uses a, a very weird, another spooky property, I would say, of quantum mechanics. And let me try to explain that to you. I've got something with me. And that's a pencil. OK? And a ball. So I'm going to show you that a weird geometry that comes in, you know, connected with materials can actually change certain amazing uh, device functionality. Take a ball, and you can do it at home. Take a pencil, and assume that all I want to do is that I want to slide this pencil. I think they should take a ball here, and yeah. Right. So slide this pencil around the surface tangentially, and then get it all the way down. Then without changing the parallelicity, don't make it, always keep it parallel turn around and come back, again to the point where you started from, from the top. Now, if this had been done with a completely, like a spherical marble, it wouldn't have made any difference. But now, when it comes back, because the pencil has a directionality, like a vector, you can see the vector has changed its direction from the point it started, and the point it came back, it has, it has got a change in direction. And this change in direction is a phase. And this phase, 
was researched for many, very long time. Actually, one of the Indian scientists, Shiva Ramakrishnan Pancharatnam, who was a uh, student of C.V. Raman uh, many years ago, did this. So, uh, you know, what we find that if we can make material in which the system can have this weird phase, the current in this material tries to go along the boundary of this material rather than get into it, and this current doesn't get spend electricity. They move without resistance. Fantastic. Because we can now have electrical component electronics where energy dissipation, you don't have to spend energy. It's like a superconductor, but this is not a superconductor. It's like a non-energy dissipative system. If you want tomorrow's electronics to actually spend very little energy, these are the kind of materials we should invest in. So, are we seeing a race? Are you seeing a revolution in quantum matter? It seems so, because now the, globally there is a huge amount of investment coming in, particularly America recently has, actually last year now, uh, 1.2 billion dollars for quantum technology. Uh, UK has now developed a, again, within the last year, year and a half, um, this new hub, material hub, for half a billion dollar. The similar kind of investments are coming from UK, uh, Germany, Japan, and so on and so forth. Um, the problem with India is that we still do not have a clear, uh, coherent program on investing in quantum matter. Uh, it's going to happen, I'm sure, uh, but we need to invest now. We need to, we need to have, uh, uh, we need to not just invest from the money point of view, but the, one of the biggest problem in India is the shortfall of human resource. 136 people per million of our population is somehow connected to scientific research. That number is 2,000 per million in China and 8,000 per million in America. So you can see the, there's a serious shortfall of human resource. And we need to educate ourselves that this is a uh, direction that society is going to move for our own sake, for example. In 20 years' time, today's children are going to, uh, are going to be in uh, interview committees. They probably will be asked questions as for a job in quantum uh, information analyst or a quantum software uh, engineer. So we need to sensitize ourselves today. So my take home message to you will be, if you don't want to spend in yuan or dollar in next few years time to buy your next laptop, and not just buy it, have to import the engineer and the programmer along with it, it's time to act now. Thank you.